genuinely. And of course, God could do whatever he wanted to be just in doing so, but God has revealed of himself that he, and he said of himself that he wants everybody to be saved. His intention is for everybody to be saved. His intention was when Jesus died that he died for every person. He's made provision for every person to be saved. Oh, bear with me here just a second. All right, did it. <laughs> cool. Uh, started to say I want to welcome back our favorite missionary tonight, but then I realized it might cause a bit of an issue. <laughs> so really glad to have all of our, well, some of our favorites here tonight. Joe, welcome back anyway. <laughs> okay. So, all right. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> all right. This first lady talked about a little bit last week. And what I talked about was basically, it was based off of a very small email, very short one that I got. But we actually got her first letter in uh, this week since her husband passed away. So I want to go back and revisit her a little bit and just talk about some things she had to say. But that would be Miss Linda Fulton, Rock of Ages Ministries. And she did say that she's had a very difficult time this last couple, well, since his passing. You know, they were married 60 years, so I can imagine that would be a bit of a trying time. But she is adjusting, and she you know, praises God for that. And the Lord's been keeping her pretty busy. She's had some opportunities open up uh, recently, in the, which are having to keep her busy. But one of them is to the women's jail in Douglas, Georgia. And already this month, since she has gotten in there, they've had seven ladies come to Christ. Amen. So y'all pray for that, and that, that. That continues to go well for her, and uh, she's able to continue those visits. She has also taken a class to be certified to enter into the prison at uh, Silverdale, which I'm assuming she didn't say, but I assume that's another women's prison. But uh, hopefully she'll be getting in there and uh, be able to uh, do her work there as well for the Lord. The, uh, she did receive the funds to purchase her Rock of Ages New Testaments, which uh, if you go into her website, this lady stays busy. <laughs> I don't know how many police departments they got there in that area where she's at, but she's, she hits them all. And the fire departments and the emergency personnel as well. And they hand out these New Testaments. And they're kind of, the cover is kind of geared towards your, your uh, first responders and all. And uh, they also hand out goodie bags to all these folks. So they've been getting plenty of those New Testaments in and the goodie bags as well. And she's very thankful for all of that. And she did to say thank you for the support which the church has been sending her. She's been receiving those and they've been much needed, much appreciated. All right, next is uh, Mr. Uh, Tony and D. Smith of Victory Baptist Press. And uh, I don't... Not real sure exactly where they're at because they're kind of everywhere. <laughs> they kind of hit five states this last uh, three months. And uh, they, but the, what they do, for those of you who don't know, they go to these churches and they present the, uh, the uh, press ministry to them in the effort to get paper rolls, which we've seen a few folks come through here for that anyway, Shelbyville over here. But they have managed to, to get to five different states, and they've been invited to five new churches on their list they hadn't had in the past. And through these efforts and the Lord's blessing, they've actually got 73 rolls of paper now for the year. They've done, done pretty well there. And on top of that, their calendar is full, so they, they've got a lot more traveling to do. And uh, hopefully they have a lot more paper coming as well. They are asking for prayers for wisdom, for guidance, and lowering costs of diesel. And what they've had to do, they've had to park their RV. And so they're doing this traveling in their car now. And uh, until the diesel prices start coming back down. So that's been a kind of uh, quite a burden on them as far as the diesel goes. And then uh, another one of our favorites who isn't here right now, Brother Buck. Uh, Brother Buck's not actually working with the uh, Welcome Truckers Ministries right now. But I guarantee wherever Brother Buck is, somebody's hearing the gospel. Uh, you go to his room right now, he's got gospel tracks all over the place. And as long as he's... <laughs> Uh, he's got a bit of an issue with his hearing, you all know, right? Uh, a lady came in here not too long ago and asked if she looked fat, and he didn't know, didn't know what she said, so he just agreed with her. <laughs> didn't go over real well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's Buck. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Buck's doing better since they got him to this new facility. Uh, he's very appreciative of all the prayers and all, and I guarantee if he's to show up and go visit him, get the chance, he'd love to see everybody here. He wanted to thank Miss Sandra and the Bryants here for a TV that they donated to him. He's uh, he got pretty tired of just counting the holes in the ceiling there for about a week, I guess it was, wasn't it? He was there. But he's, uh, as long as he don't put it on uh, some of these non-preferred channels, he, he's good to go. <laughs> but uh, he's uh, got to keep him away from uh, CNN and stuff like that. <laughs> so, anyway. But anyway...
just so you know, that's Carlos, a.k.a. Puddles. <laughs> okay. And uh, Brother Buck has kind of, he's, he just loves that little dog. I wish you could keep him with him. I really wish you could keep him with him. <laughs> that's, that's beside the point. But anyway, Buck's doing really well. And uh, uh, y'all are certainly, everybody here is in his prayers. He's excited about what he's seeing going on here at the church and hearing about. But if you do get a chance, go visit with Buck. Uh, he's, he, like I said, he's doing better, but he's not well. Uh, he's still, believe it or not, suffering with this uh, shingles. He's just painful to the touch. And, uh, you know, so just keep him in your prayers. And I know we appreciate it. And uh, that's really it for this week, <laughs> this month for me. Thank y'all. And I don't know how to turn this off, so you just stuck with the picture book. All right. It's first thing he's done that. Amen. Okay, well, let's have uh, a couple of guys uh, to pray for us. And we'll ask you to come up to the front here uh, when it's time to pray. And uh, let me ask, uh, let's see. Let me ask Brother Kurt if you would pray for us. And Brother Herschel, if you'll come again this week as well. And uh, you guys just come to the platform and and uh, we'll take our prayer request here in just a moment. Uh, I did have Buck down. His, his room is 411 at the, at the NHC. And I think Miss Barbara's trying to get him to, to come. He wants to come to the birthday party. Uh, we're trying to see if he can. That's on Sunday night for Miss Wilma. And we're trying to see if he can sit through a, a service. I'll try to make it short uh, Sunday night. But anyway, uh, hopefully we'll maybe see him on Sunday evening. Uh, remember to pray for Oslam, the little nine-year-old Bul Bulgarian girl with uh, the brain tumours. And uh, apparently she has three small tumours in her brain. She's undergoing chemotherapy right now, so pray for Oslam. And then uh, Miss Verily, as she has some health issues. Brother Pete King, who has some uh, issues there with his health of his kidneys. And uh, also Brother Jimmy Hargis, as he's recovering from surgery there a couple of weeks ago. And then also Pastor Jimmy Barrett, as he broke his ankles, and he's in recovery from that. And also Pastor Greg Nash, recovering from heart surgery. Uh, Brother Ed Davis's mom, uh, Lorraine Davis, is, she's 98, come 99 in September. Um, and she's uh, really under the weather right now. She's bedridden, so she's not doing very well. They'll also pray for Ed's mom, for Lorraine. They're in Arkansas. She's in Arkansas, right? Yeah. And then also pray for uh, the Lefebvre family who have COVID. Uh, that's the ones up in New York and I think also over in Bulgaria. They have COVID. Melissa and her family have COVID. Uh, Miss Connie has got an inner ear issue right now, so pray for her. And uh, also we got to visit with, uh, uh, with um, Roger and Ruth. Uh, that's the elderly couple that come on Sunday morning, and they have just recovered, both they and her daughter and son-in-law. Uh, they all had COVID there for a couple of weeks, and we got Leslie and I got to visit with them last night, and they're recovering, so they're doing well. They're hoping to be here Sunday, uh, so just remember them as they recover. And then also uh, Brother Martin and Miss Hannah as they go to uh, Mongolia. Uh, that's going to be not too far away, so just remember them in prayer for the trip, that all will go well, and the Lord will help them and use them when they're there. And then also remember our building, uh, as the, the old building to get it sold. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of work to it. It's all painted up. Um, it's looking really well. We've got to get the carpet shampooed. the last thing. Everything's cleaned on the outside, so it's, it's looking really good right now. Appreciate all the all those who worked with that. And the Bowmans, are you, is BMA in Enrichment week, week right now? Okay, so I, I think I saw some photo. We, we used to be in uh, with that ministry, and that's where they bring all the missionaries who are home on furlough. Uh, to the mission center and they kind of treat them for a week and uh, it's a time of refreshment and enrichment and so just pray for that and also the Bowman's involvement with that as well. All right, anything else you'd like to ask for prayer this evening? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah, I don't want that to happen. I've never prayed for a cow before. I was going to ask her for its name, but uh, I don't know if you have a name or not. But we, the Lord knows, so pray, 
pray for uh, Tara's uh, cow that uh, that it'll be it'll survive okay. And uh, see, was there anything else? Okay, anything else, just Brother Ed? Uh huh. Okay. Good, good. That's great. And uh, hopefully they'll be here uh, at least for Sunday night for sure. And uh, I know she's looking forward to that. All right. Okay. Yes, brother. Matt. Okay. It's good for uh, on starts starts Monday. Okay. Pray for Matt. All goes well there. All right. Okay, brother Kurt, if you'll lead us, and then brother Herschel, if you'll come and pray for us as well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for just guiding and directing us as uh, leaders of the church. We pray, Father, that uh, as we plan and go ahead, we just pray that you would guide us. Give us, Father, wisdom. Give us knowledge, Lord, as we prepare to, uh, uh, and with the plans to uh, construct a new church building. Father, you know our needs. You know that we need uh, uh, classrooms for our uh, kids. And Father, we need a, a baptistry area. And Father, we know that you'd provide those things for us. We just have to be patient, Lord, and go in your time frame. Father, we, we love you. We thank you, Father, for just guiding and directing in our lives. We thank you, Father, for answered prayer in the past. And as we bring our petitions for you this morning, Lord, we pray that you just might uh, honor each and every one if it be your will. We pray, Father, for our seniors. Pray uh, 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 some of them, Father, are... are uh, in an area where they, their health is not that good that they can't be in church with us. And, but, Father, there are others that uh, make that effort to come in and, and be with us, and we just thank you for those. Pray for Brother Buck, oh Lord. Pray that you give him good health. Comfort him, Lord, and help him that he might be able to uh, uh, be able to get out there and be able to care for himself. We pray, Lord, for others on our prayer list. Uh, there are numerous names, Lord. We just can't remember them all. We just we know that you know each and every one, Lord, and you know the need that they have. We pray, Lord, for not just uh, uh, those that are sick and ill, Lord. We would also pray for those that are on our list for salvation. Pray, Lord, that the word of God would come before them. They would hear it, Father. They would understand what they hear. They would believe on it, Father, and become saved to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we also being a agricultural uh, county. Father, we uh, just pray for uh, our nurseries. Pray, Lord, that uh, you might be with those owners that have the nurseries, Lord. Pray that they may have a good product to sell. We also pray, Lord, for the farmers in our area. Pray, that, pray for their animals, Lord. Pray that you just might be there to uh, touch upon uh, those animals, Father, and keep them healthy. Father, we do pray for your guidance and your direction, Lord. We pray for all that you'd have us to do. We pray, Lord, again for uh, our planning for a new house, a new uh, church building, Lord. We also pray that you'd just help us to sell the old church building, Father, and we might get a fair price for it. Lord, we pray for your guidance in that area also. Father, we do pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we do love you, and we truly thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love for us, Lord, uh, that love that's so great, Lord, that it cannot be measured, uh, how much you loved us and how much you cared for us, and you proved your love for us, Lord. May we just honor and serve you, Lord. We have a wonderful church family here and home, and Lord, we're thankful that we have a church that preaches and teaches your word, and uh, Lord, we're so blessed to have Brother Tom uh, guiding us here. And, Lord, that he's uh, mining the word there and getting us out uh, lots of jewels for us, Lord, and, and encouragements for us and helping us, Lord, to, uh, to honor to serve you, Lord, to be faithful servants and good stewards with how you bless us, Lord. We're thankful for a giving church that uh, has many missionary uh, efforts, Lord. We have many classes and opportunities here with the young people, and we ask your blessings on all the workers, Lord. Uh, I know they're working hard and a lot of times behind the scenes, and 
things that we none of us get to see, Lord. And uh, we just ask for your special blessings, Lord, for all the helpers and the workers. And we're going to need many more, Lord. And we pray we can sell that property over on West End, uh, that we can build a, uh, a bigger auditorium over here. And, uh, Lord, uh, the plans were to have lots of uh, classrooms and lots of opportunities there. And, uh, Lord, that we can grow people, uh, Lord, young and old alike, uh, that can serve you. And, uh, Lord, that can bring honor and glory to you. A place that they could uh, bring up their families, Lord, here. And, uh, Lord, um, be of use to you, Lord. Just um, yield us, Lord, to help us to uh, be filled with your Holy Spirit. And just as we go through this life, uh, let it rub off on others, Lord. It will be a good witness, be a good encouragement, Lord, for those around us. We all have family members and co-workers and neighbors and people that we meet, Lord, that need to know you. And uh, more so uh, today than ever, Lord, the fields are truly white. And, Lord, uh, we have all of the many uh, missionaries all around the world. And we pray, uh, Lord, uh, for them, their families, their safety. And, uh, Lord, they're doing a lot of work for you. And, uh, Lord, we want to have uh, many uh, brothers and sisters, Lord, in heaven through the efforts, Lord, of our church and our missionary program. And maybe someday, Lord, even in heaven, they could come up to us and throw their arms around us. And, uh, Lord, uh, and uh, just uh, for what we helped and tried to do, uh, they've got to be part of heaven, Lord. We're so uh, thankful for our programs here and our missionaries. And, uh, Lord, we ask your blessings. Uh, Lord, we do have many that are sick. I would give a word of praise for my mom, Nellie. Uh, Lord, she is doing lots better. And... Um, but she still has some problems there, and I just keep uh, wanting her to get uh, where she could come back to church with us. And I'm still praying for that. I do pray for Dan and Wilma, and Lord, you'd bless them, continue to strengthen them, and uh, bless Wilma uh, this upcoming birthday. And uh, Lord, uh, Brother Buck, uh, Lord, been encouraging me for, for many years, and continue to bless him and help him with his health. Uh, Lord, I pray for my cousin Pete King. Uh, Lord, I ask you to guide the doctors and help them, Lord, with this kidney problem he's got, that, uh, Lord, they might find answers and resolve that, Lord. And we know that uh, uh, you can do all things, Lord. We just ask for strength and health for him. Ed Davis, his mother, uh, Lord, that you would bless her and help her with her health. Uh, Lord, we do have um, uh, special prayers and needs. Uh, we do pray for our country and leaders, Lord. Uh, uh, we seem to be... Uh, in a dilemma now is a lot of a lot of leaders that seem to be going the wrong way lord and we'd ask that you'd help us lord we might elect uh, good uh, leaders lord that would follow your will and way that would align themselves with your word lord that's what we need in our government and uh, lord we just ask for special blessings there lord and uh bless uh brother matt lord is a new job there and uh, and just uh, strengthen him and continue to bless brother tom and his family and it's in jesus wonderful name we give thanks amen And again, we welcome those who are uh, joining us by way of the uh, Facebook Live. And uh, we're grateful for all those who uh, tune in from week to week. If they're not able to be here, they usually are on the, uh, the broadcast, and we're grateful for that. Well, let's take our Bibles, please. And we're going to turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Now, this is the last message in our little, little series on uh, testimony and outreach. And next uh, Wednesday, Lord willing, Brother Jeremy will be preaching for us. And he's going to have four Wednesdays, so he likely will have a, a little series that's going to put together. And then I'll have another four weeks before we head off to, uh, to Northern Ireland. So um, tonight we're going to finish this uh, little series with a message that we have preached before, but it's one that we need to uh, keep uh, ever before, is the responsibility that you and I have to be a witness for the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 33, we're going to read from verse 1 down to verse number 8, where it says, Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land... If the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he saith the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman saith the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, 
He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And Father, we thank you for this time to gather tonight. Lord, thank you for the prayers already offered. Thank you for the good missionary report. Um, we are grateful, Lord, for uh, Tony and Dee. And we pray, Lord, that you'll keep them safe as they travel around the country. And that, Lord, for Linda Fulton, Lord, we just pray for comfort in her grief. And, Lord, thank you that she, instead of giving up, has thrown herself into ministry, maybe like never before. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give her much fruit for her labors. Lord, that you'll bring encouragement and peace and help to her heart as she continues to serve you. And, uh, Lord, we uh, just pray and ask that you be with our service this evening. And we pray that you'll be with those in the Jam Club tonight. And bless uh, all the singing and the praying and the teaching. And uh, Lord, we thank you for those who have been saved recently. And we pray that many more boys and girls will understand the gospel and believe upon Christ and be saved. Help us, Lord, to be ever mindful of that uh, mission field of young people, uh, both in children's church and jam club and with the, the teens. And we ask and pray that you'll save many souls, Lord, and raise up uh, future leaders um, through the church here. Lord, we love you and we need you tonight. We pray that you'd help us as we consider our responsibility in warning others. And Lord, this is a very grave subject, and we pray that you'll give us grace, Lord, as we uh, consider these truths tonight. So Lord, be with us and help us, Lord, and we pray that you be glorified, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many hundreds of years ago, uh, there was a Viking king and the Vikings controlled, they came over from, uh, you know, the uh, modern day Sweden and uh, Norway uh, and Denmark. And they came over into the British Isles and they, they fought many wars. And one of the kings, the Viking kings, had control over the north part of Ireland. And he was going to bequeath it to one of his princes, one of his sons. He had two sons. He didn't really know which one to give it to, so he set up this competition. And the boys would get in their long boats and they would row across the 18 miles of open water between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And the promise was that the first son whose hand touched the soil of Ireland would get to be king. So he would be the, obviously the winner of the race. Well, the men started out, they're both equally strong. They rowed all the way across the North Channel of the Irish Sea. And as they got closer to the, to the shore, one of the brothers was able to pull out ahead of the other one. And so the story goes that as they got closer and closer, the one uh, was going to get there first and he would put his hand on the soil and he would get to be the king. Well, the brother that was lagging behind saw what was going to happen. And so just a, a few yards from shore, just before his brother was going to get there, he stopped rowing, the one that was lagging behind. He took out his sword, he put his left hand up on the deck of that ship, and he cut off his own hand. He threw the sword down, lifted his severed hand, which was covered in blood, and with all his strength, he threw it across the, the, the air and across the waves, and it bounced on the beach just before his brother got out of his boat and stepped ashore. And the father, seeing it, um, declared that the son uh, won, the one who cut off his hand, because his was the first hand to touch the soil of Ireland, and so he got to be the king, the Viking king of Ulster. Now, that's part of our history in Northern Ireland, and they have taken this, the sign, the symbol of the blood, the blood-stained hand, and if you go to Northern Ireland, and some of you are going to Northern Ireland in September, you'll see the symbol of the red hand of Ulster all over the place. In fact, it's in our flag. Our flag is a, flag is a white background with a red cross, a six-pointed white star in the middle, symbolizing the six counties of Northern Ireland. There's a crown above that star, representing their loyalty to the throne of England. And right in the very center of that star is a, is a red, red hand. 
And so it's been a symbol uh, of our country for, for many, many years now. And when we think of the blood-stained hand um, in Northern Ireland, it's, it's unfortunate that um, it's been really known for violence and for bloodshed for, for many, many years, and really the blood of the innocent. And in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain slew his brother Abel, God confronted Cain and said that the earth had received the blood, the innocent blood of Abel from Cain's hand. And blood on the hands always symbolizes uh, responsibility. If you go over to Matthew, keep your place there in Ezekiel if you would, and go to Matthew chapter 27. There is a very famous uh, occurrence here um, concerning the Lord Jesus and one who was trying to wash the blood from his hands. Um, in verse 24 of Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And so Pilate symbolically, and we all know the story where Pilate washed his hands and took a towel and dried his hands. He was basically saying to the crowd there that I don't want to have the blood of this just person on my hands. And so he was washing his hands of the responsibility. At least he thought he was. I think God still held him responsible because he ultimately was the one in control. And so when we think of blood on the hands, we're thinking of responsibility. Cain was responsible for the innocent blood of his brother. Uh, Pilate ultimately was responsible for the, the blood of Christ, that this innocent man was condemned to death. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 33, God uses this idea of blood on the hands or responsibility uh, that Ezekiel would have. Um, he noticed, if, if you notice again in verse number one, he says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people. And say unto them, When I bring a sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he saith the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Okay, so God says there will be times when judgment comes and enemies will come. And the responsibility of the Israelis was to take a man of their coast, someone from that particular village or town, and he was to be a watchman. And the watchman was, his duty was to watch. He was to watch for danger. If there was an enemy, if there were a band of thieves or robbers, uh, murderers coming upon the village, he was to sound an alarm. He was to take a trumpet and to sound the trumpet so that the people would know there was danger. And if the, the city had walls, they would close the gates and protect the city. Uh, they would, the, the, the men would be called to arms to protect uh, their city or their village. And so the watchman would stand upon the watchtower and it was his job to look for danger that was coming against the city. And with danger was present, his responsibility was to warn the people within the city by blowing the trumpet. And so in verse number five, if someone hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. So the responsibility of the people in the city was to heed the warning. And so if they hear, if they hear the sound of the trumpet and they, they don't take any heed to it, and they get hurt or killed over it, then it's their responsibility. Um, but if they, hear, if they hear the sound of the trumpet and they take warning and they deliver themselves, then that was the purpose of it. And then it says in verse 6, But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And what he's saying here is, if the watchman does not fulfill his responsibility to warn, the, the, the enemy's coming, and he doesn't do anything about it, and the people in the city don't know there's danger, and they come in, and it may be a judgment of God upon them, but... Because they didn't get the warning, the watchman was held responsible for not bringing a warning to the people in the city. Now, when you come down to verse 7, that's the, if you will, the illustration. And now, in verse 7, God applies this to the prophet Ezekiel. 
He says, so thou, O son of man. So God is speaking to Ezekiel. And he says, just like a watchman is there physically to protect the city, then you also are there as a watchman to warn my people because of their sin. And so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. In other words, God would give the warning from his mouth and then the prophet would hear the warning from God's mouth and he, the prophet, would warn them from God. Verse 8, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, I shall surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So God was emphasizing to Ezekiel the responsibility that he had as a prophet of God to tell them, to tell the people that judgment was coming. There was danger because of their sin. Uh, judgment was coming. And Ezekiel had to lift his voice as a trumpet and to hurl the warning of God and warn the people that judgment was coming. Now, you might think, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 18. You might be thinking, well, you know, that's kind of Old Testament. And I'm not sure how that would apply to us today as the church. Uh, obviously, we're not Israel. We don't really have prophets uh, in the same kind of way. Uh, but yet the same principle is applied to the church today. Because the Apostle Paul used this illustration, the same one given to Ezekiel, he applied it to himself. Um, if you look at his, uh, Acts chapter 18, first of all, in verse 4 to 6, and of course this was always Paul's MO. Uh, he would go into a city, uh, he would warn them, that judgment was coming, and of course he would preach the gospel to them. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So here he was. He had warned and warned and warned the Jewish people. And they weren't listening. And they weren't agreeing at all. It says here that they opposed themselves and blasphemed. And Paul basically had, it was his limit. And he, he shook his raiment. And he said, your blood be upon your own heads. And he probably did this. I'm clean. My hands are clean. Because I have preached to you and I've warned you. And I've given you the good news. And he says from henceforth. I'll go on to the Gentiles and they will hear the message. Now, if you go over to Acts chapter 20, when he meets the elders at Ephesus, um, or the elders from Ephesus at Troas, and if you look at verse 24, again, he's given his testimony, he's recounted his ministry with them. There's many things we can learn from that. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take it a record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Then if you look down at verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I believe here that Paul is speaking to people who knew the Old Testament, who knew Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 33, where it mentioned this, this, uh, this picture of warning and the responsibility of the blood on the hands. And he says that he's clean from the, from the blood of all men because he has not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. He, he warned them night and day with tears. And so what I'm saying to us tonight is that the illustration of Ezekiel, I think, applies to us. And what it means is this, is that God has declared and he's commissioned us not only as ambassadors, but also as watchmen. That when we see people who are in danger of eternal punishment and eternal hell. It is our responsibility to be a witness to them and to warn them. Now, I don't know, um, I said this some weeks ago, um, you know, 
when we, when we preach on this particular subject of, of testimony and witness, it's one of those things that I've found that no matter how much you preach about it, unless God does something in the person's heart, they're probably not going to change. But whether people change or not, it's still my responsibility to tell you, just like the watchman. It wasn't his responsibility to um, make the people heed the warning, but it was his, it's still his responsibility to tell them. And it's my responsibility as a pastor to tell you, as a believer, this is my responsibility. It's not a pastoral responsibility, it's a Christian responsibility. And you might not be a pastor, but if you're a Christian, then you have a responsibility to be a witness in some form or fashion. And allowing God to use you in, in, some, in some way, should it be just giving out gospel tracts or witnessing to your neighbours or your family or the people you work with, um, whatever it might be, inviting in the church. Um, there's got to be something that we can do in order to warn them that they are in danger before God. Now, the problem for us is, and you know, we touched on this actually on Sunday morning, when we talked about the subject of death, we must needs die, and there is water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. And yet God hath devised means whereby his bodies be not expelled from him. That's a very sobering uh, subject, not only the subject of death, but eternity and eternal death and separation from God and hell forever and ever and ever. To me, there's nothing more burdening. Uh, there's nothing heavier in the Christian life than to believe those truths. And when we believe those <coughs> truths, it does cause a burden upon our hearts. I mean, I don't see how you could get by with not being a burden. And really, the only, the only relief from that burden that I've experienced in my Christian life, when you have that burden for souls, that here's a person and there's millions of them, billions of them, who are dying without Christ, and it, it should burden us. It should bring us to tears. And the only, the only relief for that is actually when you get up and start doing something about it. When you start doing something about it, the burden is, is, is transformed into effort and work and witness and warning. And only, only then is the burden kind of relieved, honestly. Now, when we look at that illustration of Ezekiel, I kind of let my mind go and I think about it like this. Here's a man, he's a watchman, he's on the watchtower. And normally he's up there, you know, every day. They probably had different watches and so he's there for maybe, I don't know, four hours or something like that or three hours. And he's got the first watch or the second watch. And there he is and he's looking off into the distance and he's looking off in the horizon and most days, there's nothing there. He's just sitting there eating his sandwiches, you know, enjoying his time up there. But this one day, he looks off in the horizon and he sees this cloud of dust coming up. And as he continues to look at that cloud, he realizes this is an army riding on horseback and they're swiftly coming upon the city. And he see, can see their spears and their shields and their swords glinting in the sunlight as he sees this massive army coming against the city. And all of a sudden, when he realizes what this is, his heart starts pounding that here's an enemy that's going to come upon the city. Now, when he, when he looks at that, he may think to himself, well, that, I can't believe that's happening. Surely that can't be real. It's got to be a mirage. I can't believe my eyes. It can't be happening. Well, maybe it is. Man, that makes me really uncomfortable. I don't want to see that. And so what he does, he just turns his back on that and looks off in the other direction. There's not, everything's like good over here. There's nothing, no problem over here. And he ignores the reality of the enemy that's coming because it makes him uncomfortable. It burdens him. It makes him afraid. And so he just pretends like it's not there and he looks off in another direction. You know, I think that illustrates for us in some way as believers, when we realize, when we open the scriptures and we read about judgment and eternal punishment, and that the only way to escape that punishment is through Jesus Christ, and we realize that many, many, many people, even people we know and love, are not saved, and that burdens us, and it makes us uncomfortable, and we don't really like to look at it, and we really don't like to think about it, and so what we do is we just block it out of our mind, and we look off in another direction. And there's many wonderful things in the Christian life that we can look at and enjoy and rejoice in. 
Uh, but we don't want to look over here. We don't want to see this, this terrible judgment that's coming upon the unsaved because it makes us feel uncomfortable. And I think that's the way it is for many of us. But the thing about it is this. When the man is standing on the watchtower and he sees the enemy coming, he can put his sandwiches down and look over in the other direction and think, well, everything's okay. Cause, but, you know, whether he looks over here or looks over here, looks over there, or looks down uh, at his, his lunch, um, that enemy's still there. It's still real. And it's still coming. And the fact is, no matter what you... Uh, gaze at, no matter what you consider, no matter what you're thinking about as a believer, the reality of eternal punishment is still there as a reality. It won't move, it won't change. It's truth. Whether we like it or not, whether we look at it or not, whether we consider it or not, whether we believe it or not, it's still there, it's still going to happen. And so the wise man would say, you know, I don't like to look at that, but that's true and it's real. So what have I got to do? Go for the trumpet and warn the people in the city. It's true and it's real and it's happening and the enemy's coming. And hey guys, warning, lock the gates, get ready. Judgment's coming. The army's coming. All of us need to accept that burden. And the possibility of being uncomfortable and being involved in this spiritual fight and to get active and to warn people that judgment's coming. On our 20th anniversary, this is August 2003, and we took, we, our uh, honeymoon was in Gatlinburg, so we were home on furlough for our 20th anniversary and we got all the kids together, all three of them, and uh, we went up to really the same place where we had it, they knocked our hotel down, it was so nice, they knocked it down, and uh, it, was, it was old and decrepit, but uh, they built like apartment blocks, and originally you could rent them out, and I think they're all private, privately owned now, but anyway, at that point you could, you could, you could rent them, and so we rented a room, uh, two, two uh, large beds, and uh, put all the kids in there, <laughs> And uh, so we were going to enjoy our anniversary up at Gatlinburg for our 20th anniversary. Well, we were having a good time. I think it was about the third day we were there. And the kids wanted to go tubing down in the, I don't know what the river is, but it's down that goes down to Cades Cove, the little road that goes down from Gatlinburg to Cades Cove. And the, the river, beautiful river. And of course, it swaps back and forth uh, under bridges uh, down as you, as you go down on the road. And so we bought some old car inner tubes and we went to the garage and we blew them up, stuck them in a big old station wagon, stuck them in the back. The kids were all excited, we're going down the road. And it was a, a cooler kind of day for August. And so we put the windows down in the car and we're driving down this little road and uh, we're, we're going to get down to the bottom, you know, that's where they do all the, the, the floating and tubing and stuff and we're all, they're all excited about it. And so we're just enjoying the scene, it was a beautiful day. And we're, we're just driving slowly down that little road and we pass, we came, we were passing over these little bridges, and then we came to the next bridge, and there was a, a man and a woman standing by the side of the road, and they were kind of looking at us in a very strange fashion. And as we got closer to the bridge, and as we were crossing the bridge, I heard this car horn just blowing and blowing and blowing, but it, there was no car in sight. And we crossed over the bridge, and I could hear right out my window, there's, there's, a, there's a car down here, there's somebody's blowing their horn. I looked at it, I says, Leslie, there's an accident here. Couldn't see anything, but there's an accident. So I, I pulled the car over, first available spot, and TJ, he was, uh, I think he was about 17 at that time, he jumped out, I jumped out. We ran over to the bridge, looked over the bridge, there was a Samara, little soft top Jeep on its, on its roof, and there was screaming. And the horn was blowing, and my heart just started pounding. Oh, I thought, my God, we're the first ones there. Well, actually, we weren't the first ones there, because there was a couple standing right there. And they didn't do one thing. They didn't wave their hands. They didn't do anything to get us to slow down. They just stopped and looked at us. But not only that, they were standing there while a woman... And her nine-year-old daughter were screaming. Well, the, the, the woman couldn't scream because she was, she was upside down and her, she was drowning in her own blood. 
the father was in the back side of the Jeep and he, he had his head on some boulders and when I got down there he was, he was deceased. And the little girl was screaming and so TJ and I got down and uh, the little girl, her, um, I think her, one of her legs was outside the, the, uh, the sunroof and her hand was, out, was stuck in the sunroof and her teeth had all knocked out and blood was pouring everywhere and the mother was still in the driver's seat upside down uh, with her seat belt on blowing the horn and so TJ and I lifted the little jeep up as far as we could and I reached in gra grabbed the little girl's leg and pulled it out and pulled her hand out and then I got a hold of her and pulled her out through the window and handed her to Leslie and she took her up up the hill and the woman and it was, it was half in the water half out of the water and I had a latherman on me, so we went round the other side. And the door, her head actually had popped the door open. It was, the door frame was just incredible. I've never seen anything like it. But she couldn't get out because the rubber from the door seal was wrapped around her neck. So I reached in there and I cut the, the seal. And by that time, there was, I think, three or four fellas that came down. And they helped us push the car over. And I reached my arm in through the sunroof and she grabbed a hold of me and she was a big woman and she just pulled, pulled herself, basically with me helping her, pulled herself out through the, the wind, the, uh, the sunroof and we sat her down uh, by the riverside and we took shirts off and bound up her wounds. We were there a whole hour. There was no cell phone reception. Uh, people would stop and say, well, uh, uh, is there a burr? People were, you know, stop and think it was burrs. And somebody stopped here at OnStar and they pressed the OnStar and it was an hour before the, the um, emergency people got there and we just basically sat there. And there was actually another fellow came down, he was an independent Baptist preacher. She had, she had two independent Baptist preachers right there praying for her. And uh, thankfully her and her husband were saved. They were going to a Christian conference up in Gatlinburg, but very sadly he passed away. And I'll never, we'll never get over that, we'll never, we'll never forget it. And it made a real impression upon us. But one of the lessons I took away from that was when something like that happened, how could you not stop? How could you not try to do something? Yes. The wee girl was in pain. The car was lying on top of her. And I thought later on, this couple, and I can't remember, you know, they weren't much older than Leslie and I, but they were just standing there. And they didn't try to wave us down. They didn't try to warn anybody. But even more importantly than that, they didn't try to go down the hill and try to lend assistance. Now, my heart was pounding out of my chest. Maybe the man had a heart problem or something. Maybe he just couldn't physically do it because I thought I was going to die by the time I got down there. But how could you as a human being watch something like that and not try to do something about it? Well, what we're speaking about is something even more important than that. It is the eternal souls of men and women who will spend eternity somewhere. And we let them drift on by. And God says, their blood will I require at thine hand. We have to do everything that we possibly can to warn people. And really that's the difference between really being a New Testament ministry where we are doing what God wants us to do as disciples. He said, come you after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. That's what really Christianity is about as far as following the Lord and serving the Lord and being a disciple of Christ. It's about reaching others. It's about fishing for men. I will make you to become fishers of men. On the other hand, many churches just like to play church. And it's all about coming to the meeting and just getting, hearing what, what the Bible has to say and never taking that information, converting it into action where we're actually doing something to reach somebody. And so the Bible teaches us about the blood-stained hands. And when you look at your hands, you have to ask yourself, am I clean? Paul said, I'm clean. Because I've not shunned to declare unto all the counsel of God. I'm clean because I've warned you over and over and over and over again. People say, uh, well, people don't want to listen. That doesn't really matter. 
whether they listen or not, the people in the city, if they take the heed to the warning, he says some of them will do it, some of them might not, not do it, but that's not the issue. The issue is God has given us a responsibility to warn people, and if we don't warn, then we, we're responsible for that. One day we have to give an account of that. So God desires for us to be a witness, to be a warning, to speak, to shine. And when we don't, there's a responsibility there. When I was first saved, I was made aware of uh, um, a group of Christians called Calvinists. <clears throat> and I didn't know what a Calvinist was, but I, but I worked with some. And I remember, I was only saved like really a matter of weeks, probably two, th maybe three weeks. And there was a, a, an older technician in the, work, the workshop that I worked with. It was really kind of funny because once I got saved, the very next day I was telling everybody I was a Christian. And uh, I was very nervous about that. And some of, them, some of them took it well, some of them didn't take it very well at all. Um, but the interesting thing was when I came out and I said, I'm a Christian, the Christians came out of the woodwork. Now the guys that witnessed to me, I, I knew all along they were saved. But now that I said I was saved, people said, well, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian? I've worked for here two years. I didn't know you were a Christian. And one such fellow was a, name, a guy by the name of Ken, a technician. And we were out in a Land Rover getting parts, uh, going somewhere in Belfast to get parts for a truck. And so I was the apprentice. He was driving. And, and so he told me he was a Christian. So I was working with a guy called Davy Lockhart. He was my mechanic. And he was not saved, not by any stretch of the imagination. And so Ken said that he was saved. And I said, Ken, would you help me to pray for David and help me, you know, know what to say to him? Because I'm just a new Christian. And I'd love to see David become a Christian. And Ken turned to me and he said, Tom, let me tell you something. If God wants David to be saved, he will be saved. If he's one of the chosen, if he's one of the elect, then he will be saved. And if he's not one of the elect, um, then he'll never be saved no matter what you do. So you really don't have to worry about it. And I thought, sat there as a new Christian, I thought, I've never heard that before. That's kind of sounded strange to me. And it was strange because it's not true. Right. I, as I read my Bible, I, I, I started to see verses like, God who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Right. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That Jesus tasted death for every man. God genuinely, and of course God could do whatever he wanted, be just in doing so, but God has revealed of himself that he, and he said of himself that he wants everybody to be saved. His intention is for everybody to be saved. His intention was when Jesus died that he died for every person. He's made provision for every person to be saved. And so when we talk to the Calvinists, and by the way, some, you know, um, most Calvinists are saved. They're saved people, okay? And some of them are very godly people. And some, you know, some of them, you, you read the Old Testament or the, uh, the old timey commentaries and many of them were Puritans and many of them were five-point Calvinists. Spurgeon was a five-point Calvinist. But I believe they were wrong on that particular, you know, they're a product of their own theological day, I suppose, and the Reformation and the, um, the, the teachings of the Reformation. And I think some of that was, was skewed. But we talked, and I have friends who are Calvinists, but, and I would say to them, well, you know, why, why would you go witnessing if God's got it all sorted out? If, if someone's predestined to be saved or predestined to be lost, why would you even witness? Because like Ken says, well, they're going to be saved anyway. Why would you even put your, and why would you really put your life on the line? Why would you go out of your way? Why would you sacrifice in order to go and give the gospel when God's got it all wrapped up anyway? And they said, well, you just go because you're commanded to go. But what I found out with, with, uh, with Calvinistic type minded people is when, even when they're being obedient to the command of Christ and the Great Commission to go with the gospel, what I found was that there was no real heart. There was no real passion. There was no real tears. There was no real burden. Because honestly, if God's got it all wrapped up, God's not burdened about it. God's not crying over it. So why would you cry? Why, would you, why should you have a burden if God doesn't have a burden? But you know what? God actually does have a burden. And Jesus did weep over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent. How oft would I have gathered thee as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? But you would not. Jesus wept over the lost. 
And he did warn them, even though he knew that they would not heed that warning. And do you know that God in the Old Testament called a man by the name of Jonah? And God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, the great Assyrian city, who were the enemies of God's people, and ultimately were, would be their downfall uh, some hundreds of years later. And Jonah knew that. And they were a very wicked people and a very violent people. They would make examples out of cities. They would go and kill everybody. And they would, make, they would cut off body, body parts and make pyramids of heads and pyramids of hands. And they would take live people and, and, and incarcerate them in buildings and seal them up where they'd be buried alive. And then they would take people's skins. They would flay people alive, take their, their human skins and cover the buildings. with. They put the fear of the Ninevites and the Assyrians into the people that they would conquer. They were a wicked people. God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and testify on the yet, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And old Jonah says, mm, 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 not me. And he's going the other way. He, he was supposed to be going east and he went west. He was going to Spain. He was going to Tarshish. And he went down. He went down to Joppa. And then he went down into the ship and down into the belly of the ship. But you know what? God had to teach him two lessons. And the first lesson is this. It's very simple. Jonah's four chapters. First two chapters deal with the first lesson. The last three chapters deal with the second lesson. The first lesson is, Jonah, you're my servant. If I tell you to go to Nineveh, you go to Nineveh. I don't care how you feel about it. If I tell you to go, you go. Do you get the message? No, not going. Okay, here we go. And he ends up in a storm. And he knows why they're in a storm. He says to the sailors, you better throw me overboard. And they did. And the, the storm ceased as soon as he went overboard. And then God prepared a great face to come up and took uh, Jonah down to the bottom of the mountains, the Bible says. That old face took Jonah in and he went all the way down. He felt like he was in a grave already. The bars were around him, just like the ribs of the, the great face were around Jonah as he's in the belly of the wheel. And the gastric juices are just working on him. The smell, you could just imagine no, hardly any air to breathe. That's why Jonah says, they that um, rebel against the Lord forsake their own mercies. If you, you can't fight against God. If you fight against God, you're going to lose. You're going to lose big time. And so on the third day, old Jonah capitulated and he repented and he got right with God. And so God responded. And I think on the morning of the third day, he came out and the wheel spot him, up, spot him out. And he ran to Nineveh. That was a quarter distance. And Nineveh itself was a uh, three days journey across, I think it was. And he went in about a day and a half, so he was basically in the middle of Nineveh. And maybe it was all bleach from the gastric juices, we don't know. But the people certainly knew that he was from God. They believed what he said because he stood up and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then something spectacular happened. The people believed the message, which is very, very rare. But from the king on down, they believed the message of Jonah's warning. And they repented in sackcloth and ashes. And guess what Jonah did? How do you think he felt about it? He was absolutely livid. Because he just thought, sure, these wicked people are going to reject the message. In 40 days, God's going to bring judgment. And he's going to destroy all these wicked people. And here the people are repenting. And old Jonah goes nuts. He's, he's really angry. And so he says, that's, you know, he's wanting God to kill him. Well, he sits over on the east side of the city. So he goes all through the city sitting on the east side. And he's sitting down under a juniper. Or under a, uh, well, the, the gourd that God brings up this vine over Jonah. But he's sitting there waiting to see if the people would change their mind. Now you question, why did Jonah go? Did Jonah have a burden for the people? Did Jonah really want to see the Ninevites saved? No, no, no. He simply went to obey God. That was the first lesson. He had to go because God commanded him to go. Okay, so that's where the Calvinists are. They go because God says to go and to preach the gospel. But is that enough? No, because there's another two chapters. And what we find then is that Jonah is going to be taught a second lesson. And that God prepared this gourd. This gourd was a vegetable plant and this vine came up. It was, I guess, supernatural because it came up in one night. And it, 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 it was like a little booth over uh, Jonah to protect him from the sun. And he really enjoyed this thing. Uh, you know, sometimes you like your garden. You go out and sit in your garden. It's, you know, it's wonderful things God has provided for us. You just sit. I mean, 
Um, even the weather being hot, it's just the, the beauty of creation is wonderful, especially here in Tennessee, and, and God has made it for us to enjoy. So get out and enjoy it. You should enjoy uh, the creation of God. And old Jonah fell in love with this thing. And then God prepared a worm. And just like it came up on one night, it was destroyed on one night. This worm ate the thing. And all of a sudden it all came down and was withered on the ground. And old Jonah really lost it. He says, that said, you should kill me now because I love this thing and you've destroyed it. God, why did you, ki why did you kill this on me? And so God had a little chat with Jonah. He says, Jonah, I want to talk to you for a minute. He says, you have had compassion on this plant, which you didn't make to grow. It came up in a night, was destroyed in a night. And your affection was upon this plant. And that you're mad at me because I have compassion and affection upon the Ninevites. And 120,000 of them do not know their left hand from the right, meaning there's children involved here who are basically innocent of what's going on. And you just want me to destroy everything, the children and all. Hey, Jonah, who do you think has the right value here? Let's compare notes. Are you right and I'm wrong, or are you wrong and I'm right? And Jonah had to learn the second lesson, and the second lesson was this. First lesson is, Jonah, go because I'm telling you to go. And you should just do it because I'm God and you're my servant. We should understand that. But the most important lesson is this, is Jonah, I just don't want you to go because you're commanded. I want you to go for the same reason why I'm sending you. Why is God sending you, Jonah? Because he loves people, even sinful people. And Jonah, I want you to reflect me. I want you to have the same feeling in your heart that I have in my heart. I want you to go for the same reason why I'm sending you. I want you to have compassion. I want you to have love. I want you to have concern in your heart for those people. I want you to be like me. That was lesson number two. And did Jonah learn that lesson? Yes, he did, because he wrote the book. Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. And so he did learn that lesson. And he did understand that it's not just a matter of being obedient to go to warn when our heart's not in it and we don't really care. But we should go with compassion. We should go with love. We should go with burden. We should go with tears. And it shouldn't be just, well, God is, you know, predestined some for heaven, some for hell. and doesn't really matter. No, we should go as an extension of the love of God and the compassion of God with the, the passion and tears that Jesus would have had. Our hearts should be in it. We should be pleading for people and warning people. That's the way it should be. So tonight, this is just a little reminder that you and I are responsible for God to warn people. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you do it or not, one day we're going to have to give an account of how we've warned. And God says, their blood will I require at thine hand. God has given us life and opportunity. He has given us the truth. He set you in a church that emphasizes the truth and really puts, tries to push the emphasis where God puts the emphasis and gives you opportunity to witness. If you don't know how to do it, go out with us on Tuesday night. You don't have to do anything. We'll just show you how to do it. Um, and really, that's a good, it's a good way to learn how to do it when you're not out on Tuesday night, when you're just talking to somebody and you know how to do it because you've done it. You've given, been given all these opportunities and it wouldn't be sad at the end of our time on earth, when we stand before God and we have to give an account and we stand there with bloody hands because we have not fulfilled our responsibility to warn. Now, maybe all of us have bloody hands to some extent, but all of us need to have the desire to say with Paul, I'm clean because I've warned you. There's lots of people that we have warned that didn't heed the warning, but that's not the issue. The issue is we still have to warn. The blood-stained hands. How are your hands tonight? Mm. Would you ask God to help you? To warn somebody? To talk to somebody? To tell somebody? Leave a gospel track? Do something. Do something.
try something. Father, we pray you'll help us tonight. I know this is a heavy message. It's one we don't like to preach, we don't like to hear, but Lord, it's true anyway. And we really do have a responsibility to warn. So Lord, help us to take the illustration of Ezekiel as Paul applied it to himself in the church age. Lord, it applies to us too. We have a responsibility to go fishing for men and to warn people that judgment's coming. Help us to do everything we can. Lord, here at the church, through the radio broadcast, through the, through the YouTube, through the Facebook, through uh, the television broadcast, radio broadcast, uh, our services, our witnessing, our literature, everything we know to do. Lord, help us to do all we can to warn people and help us all to be involved with that. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.